This, I think it's where we left off. All right, we've got lab today. <clears throat> Downstairs, 018. Got to remember to stop by and make sure the door's unlocked. Um, feel free to go in um, if you get there early. So as long as the door's unlocked, just go in, flip the light on. Um, I don't think lab is going to take full time. Uh, normally, the lab's going to be uh, free time to, to look at to look at specimens, try to identify the different different items on the word list. Uh, today, we're going to uh, you're going to be tasked with drawing one of the the worm specimens, um, and we'll we'll break it up. There's basically two, and we'll just kind of split it around. And this is more about an exercise of paying attention to detail uh, and learning like how to use the microscope and, and, and whatnot. Uh, also, we're going to pick our species you know, for presentations. So make sure you look at that list that's posted. We already have one that is picked. So we need to. Uh, Get our species picked, uh, figure out some of the dates on when we will present, uh, because our first presentations will be next week. So you go first, you set the standard. That's the way, that's the way I look. It works. All right. I also posted the, our first quiz, online quiz. It's for the uh, terminology, all the definitions. I have that due on Wednesday night, 11.30. That'll, that'll be typical. So go ahead, rev you review the terminology. Uh, we should finish the immunology, hopefully, today. Uh, so then we'll, we'll start with our uh, Platy Hillman's intro, and we'll start moving through these. All right, any questions? All right, so this is where we left off. We're doing our background of the uh, immune system. Basically, immunology lecture, you know, a semester lecture cut down into one and a half lectures, you can say. So we talked about immunity uh, versus resistance, infective versus non-infective, all, all of that stuff. So what we're interested in is the actual immune response. All right, and we have a couple types of immunity to describe. So the first is the innate immune response, innate immunity. This is, these are going to be mechanisms that don't depend on any prior exposure. It is basically one of our, our lines of defenses where the body just recognizes it as a foreign invader and takes, takes action, right? It, it recognizes it as a non-self item and then responds. And during that response, then, they will build a memory response. So if they see it again, that response is going to be much, much quick, quicker and more potent, all right? So the adaptive immunity is that memory response. You need that prior exposure to build it, and it's going to be very specific to the non-self material. So the innate immunity is just, it recognizes it as non-self, that's it. All right, and it responds, but it's a slow type response. Adaptive immunity, it recognizes a specific component on that foreign invader uh, and reacts very, very strongly. We then have two incomplete immune responses, and we're going to, we're going to separate them. Uh, premonition and concomitant immunity. The end results are basically the same, is that our infection is going to persist, and by persisting in our body, it's going to confer protection against other organisms, other foreign invaders. Premonition uh, is a situation where our parasite that's in the host is actually harmed. All right, The immune response is effective. It's working against it. But it's just there are other mechanisms there that are allowing the, the parasite to persist. Because that parasite's persisting, the host is attacking that parasite. Uh, and that, that heightened elevation is preventing more of that same par parasite from, be being, uh, from invading the host and infecting. Or in some cases, it prevents other organisms, other viruses, and other bacteria from infecting. Concomitant immunity is a situation where our parasite is unharmed. All right? No matter what the host immune system does, what, it throw, what we throw at it, 
parasite isn't hurt at all. All right, they can still persist, but that that host response is usually going to be protective in other ways, meaning it's going to prevent reinfection uh, by perhaps the same parasite and also prevent some other bacteria and viruses from taking hold. We will see both of these terms, and that really the key difference is, is that parasite that's inside the host, is that harmed or not? Is it harmed or not? All right. So let's talk about the innate defense mechanisms. We're going to break it down and talk about the innate and the adaptive responses. So the innate defense mechanisms are those that you don't need the prior exposures, and we've got several different innate responses. So hopefully one you can think about is the just the unbroken surface of, of organisms. That's, a, that's our skin and stuff. That provides a defense, keeps things out. All right, bacteria, they're not going to burrow through, uh, burrow through our skin. So that's... First type of innate defense mechanism. Uh, those surfaces that are soft usually have a mucus layer. And that mucus layer can kind of provide a space or a slight barrier to a foreign invader. That can also act as an innate defense mechanism. Not only that, but the mucus layer could have other compounds in them that are antimicrobial, anti-parasitical, uh, all right, anti, what do you think, anti-parasitical, that sounds right, pronunciations. Um, so some of those items in the mucus are also in the mucin layer, the GI tract, all right, I say it acts as a force shield, again, kind of keeps some of our protozoan parasites from getting to the surface of the cell where they might attach, and penetrate in, into the shell and into those cells. And then you have antimicrobial molecules. All right, these are uh, pattern recognition receptors. You can have pathogen associated molecular patterns. You can also have the complement cascades. All right, these are all innate immune responses. They recognize things as being uh, foreign. And then once they're recognized as foreign, then our immune system responds. So the pattern recognition receptors, PRRs, uh, they can be attached to the, to the cells or they can be secreted so that they then tag the invaders. Uh, Toll-like receptors are classic ex examples of these. Um, so, and, and same thing with the pattern-associated molecular patterns. These are things that are on the surface of, of our molecules. Oftentimes you hear it in terms of bacterial, having these things that our body recognizes as saying, hey, th these aren't right. Let's respond. It's these things that the initial parasite infection turns on, or at least that's how they, they initially get recognized. Um, complement cascade is also ex ex important. So the complement, what does a complement cascade do? I mean, we say it attacks foreign membranes. What do they do? We said immunology. Remember what, what they do? Well, from what I remember is like, I, I can't really think of the words, but I know working together to, um, I know it's something to do with working together to attack something. Attack our foreign membranes. Yes, that's. So what the complement cascade usually does, it attacks foreign membranes and then tries to poke holes in them. All right. And this can be an effective defense mechanism. It's effective against our parasites, which, which is why some of our parasites that we'll discuss, they secrete compounds that inhibit this complement cascade. They try to prevent it from, from taking hold long enough to where they get to the stage where that cascade is, is no longer effective. So uh, those are antimicrobial molecules. And then you have to consider all the other things. We say chemical defenses. So pH of the stomach is protective. You know, you have hydrolytic enzymes uh, in the stomach that's pr uh, protective. We've got IgA, you've got lysozymes and so forth. All of these things that can break down foreign invaders. This is all innate defense mechanisms. All right, so once, an innate, once this innate defense mechanism uh, takes hold, basically this part takes on, then what's going to happen 
uh, is that we have our cellular, our cellular defenses. Right? Our macrophages respond. They bind to our invader because they, they're tagged. And then they internalize that invader. And once they inter internalize that invader, so that's a phagosome, and the phagosome is going to bind uh, with lysosomes. You're going to have drops in pH. You're going to create these acidic conditions, these uh, enzymatic conditions to try to break up the foreign invader that then dumps it out of the cell as soluble, soluble degree, uh, debris. You also then have some cells come along. They do basically the same thing. They take up the foreign molecule, got a phagosome, it binds with our lysosomes um, that then start to try to break down the organism. They, they can then process some of these particles and express it on the surface to try to turn on and activate our, uh, our acquired, our adaptive responses. So we're going to see lists that become very important for some of our parasites, where they, they are going to be internalized. They need to be internalized. But then you have pathways that try to inhibit this fusion at least long enough for the parasite to transform and to the point where they can survive inside the cell. So we're going to see this again. So that's phagocytosis. Uh, numerous cells take part in this in innate type of uh, response, including cells in invertebrates. So you might think of invertebrates as being very primitive. All right? They're not. They're old. They're derived, all right? and they have their own immune system. They have their own responses. Now, the cells that we, that we recognize as immune-type cells take on different names based on the groups. All right? So these archaeocytes, amoebocytes, uh, hemocytes, alomocytes, etc. They, they all seem to exhibit the same type of phagocytic ability, um, just they took on a different name based on the group of organisms that, that we're studying. So, just because you have invertebrates being infected, don't assume that they don't have an immune response. They do. They've got this innate response. And there's more research showing that some of these organisms actually seem to exhibit some sort of memory response. So they get infected. They have the parasite. The innate re immune response responds. All right, And then if they challenge that host again with the same parasite, the parasite never became, becomes established. It gets killed off very, very quickly. So they're maybe there is some memory response in these inverts. In the vertebrates, you know, this is where the immunology course focuses on, we've got a, a, a host of cells that act as uh, phagocytizers. So we've got our monocytes. All right. uh, these monocytes are part of the reticular endothelial system, RE system. They're usually some of our first responders. Uh, the ones that we're going to talk about are macrophages primarily. They're one of the common ones, the common first responders. You find those in the lymph nodes. They get called in different parts uh, of the body. We have the invaders. But we also have cup for cells. These are in the liver. Uh, we have microglial cells in the central nervous system. These are all phagocytizing cells. So the monocytes are going to play a role in some of our protozoan parasites. Dendritic cells are also phagocytizers. These cells are... Um, originate in the bone marrow, right? and when they are immature, they are active phagocyte, uh, phagocytes because they're going to take up and they're going to start expressing some of these uh, foreign in invader molecules, uh, parts of the molecules on their surface. And then we have granulocytes, also called polymorphonuclear leukocytes, PNA. All right, this is the uh, neutrophils, the eosinophils, basophils, mast cells, uh, all these different cells. Neutrophils and eosinophils are kind of uh, important uh, for this class. Eosinophils especially because normally you go in and you have high, uh, high counts of eosinophils, it's either uh, allergies or potentially parasitic infection. So you can see you get a pretty high response against parasites with, with these uh, phagocytizing cells. What about the adaptive immune response? Well, we need the memory response. So basic idea is that you have this antigen, this AG, that's what, what we'll use for antigen, right, the, gets into the body, the body recognizes it, or the body forms a response against it, that's our, our innate response, and then it forms a memory against that specific antigen. 
how does it do, how does it have that memory? Well, we basically develop antibodies against that specific part of the antigen. So the antibodies are immunoglobulins, they're on the surface of B cells, or they can be secreted by plasma cells. And plasma cells are derived from B cells. All right, so these antibodies circulate around the body. When they find that specific antigen, they will bind to it. And then when a macrophage comes around and hits that, hits that antibody and, and binds to it, it recognizes that it has an attachment. Something's attached to the antibody, and it does not have a self-tag, self you can say. It doesn't have a tag that says, I'm part of the body. So then we start responding against it. Antibodies, uh, we also have memory response that are on T-cell receptors. So these are basically antibodies that are on the surface of our T lymphocytes. Now, we have to have a way to, to identify self versus non-self because we have a bunch of cells in our body that end up dying and they get cleared out by our own body. We're going to have some antibodies that will recognize uh, our own body. So how does these first responders know that it's us and not a foreign invader? Well, this is where the major histopathability complexes come in. All right, these are proteins embedded on the cell surface. All right, the foreign invaders don't have it, but we have it. Our own, our own body has these types of cells. And we've got two different classes. Class 1 type MHCs are on all cells. Class 2 are only on our immune cells. So if a macrophage comes up, recognizes that the antibody is bound to something, to some foreign invader, if it has one of these MHC molecules, hey, itself, I'm going to let you go. But if it doesn't, now we start a cascade. We start a cascade that starts to phagocytize that foreign invader. So these antibodies are all immunoglobulins, and we've got a bunch of, bunch of different types. We've got IgM, IgG, IgA, IgD, IgE. They are all named for Greek letters. So this is Ig mu, Ig gamma, Ig alpha, delta, and epsilon. They're all circulating. They're all circulating in our body. They're circulating in different, different proportions. IgG is a, a prominent player, but so is IgM and IgA. All right, so how does it work? How do these antibodies work? They've got a different functions. They've got a different, couple different ways in which they're going to work to eliminate our foreign invader. So one is opsonization. All right, and this is the tagging. The antibody tags a foreign invader, recognizes it. And then once it gets tagged, then our macrophages are going to respond, recognize that it's, that it's tagged, and start to try to phagocytize it. So our antibodies, you can think of it as a Y-shaped. We've got the two arms of the Y. That's what's recognizing our foreign invader. And then the, the long branch of the Y, that's our crystallization fraction, the FC fraction. That is what's attached to cells, if they're on like T cells uh, or memory B cells. All right? If they're not, then that, that site is open and macrophages will come and bind to it and see, hey, do you have that MHC or not? All right. So this is the opsonization is what we typically think of. We also have neutralization. So with the neutralization, what the antibodies are doing are trying to bind our foreign invader and prevent it from actually taking action. Many cases, we're binding it and, and encapsulating it with antibodies to keep that cell recognition uh, protein on that invader from getting to the, at its target. All right, so probably here with COVID, you, know, you talk about these neutralizing antibodies, what they would do is go around that virus and keep the virus from actually contacting our cell membrane. If you keep it from contacting the cell membrane, you can't have the binding, you can't have the internalization. That's our neutralization. Uh, you've got IgG and IgM can work as neutralizing antibodies. Uh, normally, uh, they work on bacterial toxins. And if you prevent the toxins from, from binding to their target, you prevent the toxins from actually getting people sick. IgAs are in digestive and respiratory secretions. They also try to neutralize toxins. 
And then we've got just all of them tend to uh, or can act to envelope viruses and thus prevent them from binding to the cells. So we've got opsonization and neutralization. Is neutralization important for parasites? Possibly, especially our protozoan parasites. But it's going to be really hard for antibodies to completely coat a, a, a larger worm. Third thing for the antibodies is activation of complement. So antibody responds, complement cascade recognizes uh, that it's there, and then it ramps up completely. Uh, so don't think the cascade is just for the innate immune response. The cascade can get turned on by the adaptive response. And then last is this antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxin. ADCC. We'll use this uh, a few times in this class. Right. This is basically eosinophils. All right, so you're going to have interleukin-5, which is a cytokine, chemical signaler. All right. So eosinophils get activated. Uh, you also have lymphoid cells and neutrophils, but they're going to come in. They are going to try to surround and kill that foreign invader, and in some cases, it will kill our own cells with it, all right? This is targeting the bloodstream form of Trypanosoma cruzi, which is the causative agent of Chagas disease. So we'll see ana antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity. So in order for this to happen, you're gonna have antibodies binding, and then they trigger these cells to kind of get, get around, encapsulate, and then they try to flatten and dump their enzymatic contents right on that invader to try to break down the membranes, break down the integrity of the cell membrane. So a lot of functions of the antibodies. Antigen pre presentation is how we start to form our memory response. So in our top part, that is where we get our uh, initial uh, phagocytosis, so our foreign invader represents our, where's my cursor, here it is. That's our foreign invader. You get a first responder come in, phagocytize, process part of that antigen and express it on its surface. All right? That part that gets expressed, that is our ep epitope, and that is what we're going to respond to. The antibodies are going to recognize not only the sequence, a specific short sequence uh, of a protein, but it can also recognize a three-dimensional shape. All right, so it's not just a linear sequence that it will recognize. Also, we like to think of it as being very specific, but evolution has allowed some of our antibodies, some of these things to be a little bit sloppy. That's how you can get some minor protection against a slightly different invader. So in terms of what we've had in these last two years, you had your alpha variant of, of SARS-CoV-2. That was the initial strain. That's what our vaccine was developed against. And then the Delta strain came along, and we had some protection. Uh, that was from some of the sloppiness uh, of, of, our, of our system. But now, if we're at Omicron, that sloppiness really hasn't helped. But we present our cells, goes to the B cells, which then forms our memory response. So once we get our memory response, now you're going to produce your plasma cells and additional memory B cells. So once you get a memory B cell, then it's going to recognize that invader, and then it just ramps up and starts exponentially replicating and producing more antibodies to fight this invader. So you've got like a two-step process. First, we have to see that invader and we have to form a memory response to it. And then once we have that invader one, and we recognize it again, we'll have this amplification process. In some cases, we need a second dose just to kind of uh, reinforce uh, that memory. All right, so this is dependent on our T cells. This whole response is dependent on our T cells. And I'm going to break it down. We've got quite a few different T cells. You'll probably have an entire course, special topics course on T cells. Uh, but we've got T helper 1 cells and T helper 2 cells. And how I'm going to present it is kind of break it down into two different types of responses. Right. TH1 type response and a TH2 type response. Keep it simple. All right. This is basically 
a difference between like a predominantly cell-mediated response or a predominantly humoral response, antibody response. All right. If the T, T helper 1 cells get activated, we're going to start moving towards the cell responses, the macrophages uh, and such. And as we're, if we're going that way, we're going to try to reduce the expression of our, our uh, humoral responses, the antibody type responses. If the Th2 cells, T helper uh, 2 type cells get activated, we're going to go more towards the antibody response and we're going to try to inhibit that cell-mediated response. And I've got a diagram here to kind of go through it. We also have cytotoxic T lymphocytes. These are CD8 cells. They target cells and try to kill them. Uh, all right, so they're targeting cells with certain epitopes, try to kill them. And then we have the regulatory T cells. These are CD4 cells. They respond by basically trying to suppress our immune system. Because what we don't want to see happen is our immune system ramp up so strongly that it actually hurts the body and kills us. So this is where the regulatory T cells come into play. You hear about this, uh, you've heard it, they talked about it, was this, um, what's the term that they used? Uh, runaway, runaway, I'm sure I'll remember it again. So basically overexpression. Oh, cytokine storm. Cytokine storm. Cytokine storm, they say it's a runaway immune system. When you have a cytokine storm, oftentimes it's a problem with these T regs. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't inhibit our immune response completely. All right, so this is kind of like the summary. You've got this Th1 arm, this Th1 branch on this side, you've got your Th2 branch on this side. Anything with a solid line is saying we're leading to these cytokines, the, the production of these cells. So if we go to the Th1 type response, all right, you've got your T helper, uh, your antigen presenting cells, your T lymphocyte becomes Th1 lymphocytes. We're going to activate or release interleukin 2. That turns on, stimulates macrophage production, natural killer production. All right, macrophages are going to produce tumor necrosis factor that then. Uh, help stimulate these polymorphonuclear leukocytes, these responders, they're going to come in, try to take out the cells, all again, try to, it's killing everything based on the cells. This is also, in order to induce the macrophages, we're producing interfering gamma. With that interfering gamma, once that becomes apparent, it's going to inhibit the maturation and release of these guys. So if we can inhibit this, then we become predominantly the cell-mediated response. If we want a Th2 type response, then we're getting to this side. We're producing these various interleukins, all right? And once we get to interleukin 10 and interleukin 4, it's those that are going to start inhibiting the Th1s so that we predominantly get this type of memory response, which is antibodies and then your antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity with your eosinophils and so forth, all right? This is important because when we talk about parasites, the parasites are going to be killed by the immune system, but a lot of these parasites are only going to be killed by one side of this response. So if you have a parasite that is very susceptible to this side, the cytotoxic T lymphocytes and macrophages, then what the parasite might try to do to evade it is to inhibit this side from turning on and thus force the body to respond to this way. Why is that beneficial? Because this side is, is pretty much worthless against the parasite. Likewise, if you have a parasite that can get killed by these antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity responses and by the antibodies, all right, it's going to want to try to inhibit this side from coming on, which means we're going to turn on this side of the pathway. And this side of the pathway is producing the cells that have little, if any, effect on our parasite. These are types of parasite evasion mechanisms that we're going to be talking about. A lot of them do this. Now, what we don't have is that cascade, the complement cascade. The complement cascade is going to get turned on by both sides. All right? So if the complement cascade is the one that's successful at killing off the parasite, the parasite's going to do what it can to inhibit that. All right. Uh, and you can find this. Again, it's presented how I learned it. When I was going through school, it was kind of like an 
one or the other. You go this way or you go that way. Since that time, we've discovered that it's, it's, it's less clear because interferon gamma also takes on these cells, these B cells, and that can generate some uh, minor antibody responses. So it's, it's less clear. We're going to say it's mostly one, side, one type or mostly the other. That's how we're going to proceed with it. All right. So with a humoral response, uh, this is basically what we just kind of talked through. Uh, you get your uh, Th2 cells, and that causes proliferation over B cells and your antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity responses. If the Th1 cells get activated, now we have our cellular responses. These are all aimed at trying to phagocytize and killing of our, of our parasites without using our antibodies. All right, so with our cell-mediated immune responses, we, had, we see some interesting aspects to it, all right? Because if we go back to this, we have production of compounds, tumor necrosis factor, TNF, interferon gamma, IL-2s, these things kind of induce inflammatory responses. And the inflammatory responses are basically those responses that are calling these cells in to fight the invader. All right? So sometimes we'll get a delayed type hypersensitivity reaction. This is where our Th1 cells secrete cytokines, ultimately leading to inflammation. The inflammation is basically macrophages coming in to that area. And there, there's more to it. There's it basically changes in a blood vessel to allow uh, easier movement through the blood vessels and into the tissue and all that stuff. Immunology should have covered that. We're going to do less of that. Uh, no, actually, we'll, we'll, we'll bring that up when we talk about schistosoma. We'll talk about some of that. Uh, cytotoxic T lymphocytes, CTL. Here are uh, cytotoxic T lymphocytes behind. Now they inject perforin. They're trying to perforate the target, which is kind of similar to what complement does, but complement isn't really using perforin to do this. So perforin is, is important for our cytotoxic T lymphocytes. And again, if these are effective against the parasite, the parasite will try to inhibit these cells from responding. Natural killer cells, these non-specifically lice target cells, uh, again, disrupt our cell membrane. And then our immediate hypersensitivity is basically mediated by IgE and the Th2 arm. So your delayed type hypersensitivity reactions, all of these, it takes a while for the cells to respond. You see the invader, and then maybe it's 24 hours or more before you start getting this infl inflammation. If we have immediate hypersensitivity reaction, it's primarily IgE, and it happens very, very quickly. All right? Happens very, very quickly. And this immediate hypersensitivity reaction... Uh, is basically the reason why some people, they have a very fast and rapid uh, allergic response, say with peanuts or with bee stings and so forth. Uh, eosinophils are the responders. All right, so what is this inflammation? Well, normally if you get inflammation, it's a sign of cellular immunity. All right, but how much inflammation you get kind of depends on prior history with this foreign invader and also the duration of that presence. All right? So sometimes if you have, uh, if you've seen it before, you're going to have a much a heightened response to that foreign invader. Uh, and perhaps if you've seen it a long time or if it's persisting, you'll get a stronger and stronger inflammatory response. If we have delayed type hypersensitivity reaction, I already said it's going to happen normally 24 hours or more. The important players here are tumor necrosis factor, uh, interferon gamma, and then these monocytes and uh, granulocytes. So tumor necrosis factor, again, we're going to talk about some of these roles. They're going to allow the leukocytes, so they're going to stimulate kind of a stickiness of the leukocytes so that they can bind to the blood vessels in a way that they can then move through them to get to our tissue, all right? So it calls in basically neutrophils first, and then you have your lymphocytes and the mono monocytes. We also 
with this tumor necrosis factor, it's, it stimulates the endothelium to secrete inflammatory cytokines, but specifically IL-8. So once you get this, this response, this IL-8, now our vessels start to loosen up so that you can have these cells move through the vessel itself, through the vessel wall. That's further aided by interferon gamma. All right. And when these get activated and you start exhibiting infl inflammation governed by these things, monocytes are going to be our main effectors, so our macrophages. They're going to phagocytize, secrete our mediators, secrete cytokines, additional growth factors, call in more reinforcements to kill things up. In some cases, our, our foreign invader is bigger than the macrophages. So they can't eat the macrophages. They can't eat the invader. So what happens? Well, then what these cells will try to do is encapsulate the foreign invader. If you can encapsulate it, then you can prevent that foreign invader and the substances released by that invader from getting to the rest of the body. All right? And when you get this encapsulation, you form what's called a granuloma, which is essentially a nodule of inflammatory tissue. This is important for our eggs, schistosoma eggs, to get not only through the blood vessels, but also to be moved through tissue into the lumen of the gut or the bladder. So we're going to talk about granulomas and, and how they do that. So in essence, schistosoma relies on the host immune system to get their eggs out of the host. Occasionally, though, you get nailed and you exhibit this immediate hypersensitivity re response. This is going to be less than normally within hours within hours, all right? Key thing here is that the mast cells become degranulated. So they dump a bunch of uh, inflammatory compounds, all right? Inflammatory compounds, and then you get a couple of characteristics, wheel, flare, and then ultimately anaphylaxis. So wheel is swelling, it's caused by the blood plasma escaping from the vascular system and right into the surrounding tissue. All right, you get nailed by a bee, perhaps you'll notice swelling starting to happen. This is that, that wheel. Flare is the redness that's associated with that. Now you've got your blood vessels being engorged, and again, you can, can kind of think about why this is happening. If you've got in, in, inflammation, you're calling in the immune system. You're trying to increase blood flow to get those cells to that site of the foreign invader. You get localized swelling, you get redness, and then, if it's severe, you can ultimately go into anaphylaxis, which is basically, instead of keeping that hypersensitivity reaction to a localized spot, it becomes systemic. The entire body starts to do this. And in some cases, this is, this is the bad part. Oops, this is the bad part. We want to try to avoid that. That's why some, some people have the EpiPens. Try to minimize. If you start getting this part, take care of it. There is parasite uh, that can ultimately produce this if the parasite ruptures. So we'll talk about that. Uh, with this type of inflammation, even with the delayed type hypersensitivity reactions, you do get some necrosis right, as a consequence of the cytokines and the responders. All right, so when you get this necrosis, it's basically surrounding cells, they're uninfected, but they get some of these signals to say, I'm just going to go ahead and die. Or the, the signals themselves cause the death to kill, or cause the death of these cells. So sometimes you'll get an abscess, all right, which basically is buildup of pus, which is kind of gross. Uh, or you get ulcer, which is inflammation that ultimately leads to an open sore. And we'll see ulcers in some of our protozoan at least one of our protozoan parasites. This immediate hypersensitivity reaction is the basis for allergies and also asthma. All right, so this was a crash course through immunology. Hopefully we've covered all the terms that we need. Uh, again, this whole presentation was all uh, FYI for us because we will come back to the specifics. And once we get to those specifics, then it's fair game. Then it's fair game. But I think it's important to kind of go through and see what we're dealing with, 
so you can better so at least you have some idea of what the parasites how they possibly can be escaping uh, a host immune system so this presentation's up you can download it um, check it out um, all right so I didn't think I could do that I could get to this but we will so we are now getting into parasite stuff oh uh, I guess I should tell you. I think I, if you didn't see the announcement, it's easy enough for me to record the lectures, to live stream the lectures so that they're available. So we're just going to do that. I shared the, the playlist so you have it, but I do expect you to come in uh, because this is probably the best way to, to answer questions or ask questions and everything. But it's going to be up, so if you miss something, you can always go back and check it out. All right. So we're going to break this course down into basically three different units. All right, unit one is the platyhelminths, phylum platyhelminthes. All right, this is unusual because a lot of people start at like the protozoans, then they work forward to the more uh, metazoan uh, parasites uh, or to more uh, larger multicellular organisms, I should say. Uh, but we're doing it different because uh, we have some honor students that need to do projects. And the most likely parasites that we will encounter will be the platyhelminthes and the nematodes. So we're going to start with the platyhelminthes first. So general information. Ooh, hold on. I didn't print. I didn't print out those handouts. Who would like a printout? Well, hold on. Let's see here. One, two, eleven. Okay. I'll have about 15 or so. I'll, br I'll bring them in because we only have like five minutes or so. Bless you. We only have about five minutes or so. So general information for the platyhelminths. Platyhelminthes quite literally means flatworms. Platy flat. Who's in stats class? Elijah was in stats class, right? What do we, what was the term of that non-normal distribution that's real flat, shouldered? Remember that? Platy Kurdic? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? Platy, again, Platy, name comes up. We've got about 30,000 species, all right, in this group, and most of them are obligate parasites. Although we do have some platy helminths that are free living, and you've probably seen these. These are the turbularians, all right? The free living flatworms, the turbularians. General morphology is that they are dorsal ventrally flattened, hence their name. All right, so you look at them, all right? you got the organism. Divide them in half so you've got a mirror image, and then you just compress them. They're dorsal ventrally flattened. Ventral side on the front, ventral side on the back. There's no segmentation in these worms, all right? and this is different. This is different than what we normally see, and I point this out because the cestodes, the tapeworms, look like they might be segmented. They've got individual sections called proglottids. But actually, cestodes are more modular. They're not, they're, not, they're not segmented. They don't exhibit true segmentation or even pseudo-segmentation. They're modular, where each proglottid itself contains a complete set of reproductive structures and organs. Right, and that's different from seg segmentation. All right, so these organisms are dorsal ventrally flattened, and they are bilaterally symmetric. So draw a line here, basically mirror images. Now that is just for the exterior surfaces, all right? So our internal structures, maybe they're uh, bilaterally symmetric, but oftentimes they're not. I mean, you don't see, you know, normally you don't see more than one ovary in an organism. And if the ovary is not down that midline, then you don't have a mirror image of that reproductive structure. So these organisms are acelomate. What does that mean? Let's say they lack a coelom. Right, so they lack that body cavity. Instead, the inner space is filled with parenchyma. Parenchyma is a spongy mass, evacuated mesenchymal cells filling the spaces between viscera, muscles, or epithelia. In essence, this is loose connective tissue. 
But it's important because we don't have a body cavity. We don't have a coelom. We will have some parasites that do, but not these guys. All right, do you guys get this? Uh, I think we'll just stop here. My clock says 1048. I left my watch at home. I can't believe it. This watch says 1048. So we'll stop here. Uh, we're going to look at, we're starting with the flatworms. All right. We're going to start with the digenetic trematodes. So um, come prepared to look at it. Uh, I did have, I think on the lab, I had an optional book called The Color Atlas of Parasitology. I have a couple copies in the lab, and actually, since we're in the lab now with computers, uh, I probably wouldn't recommend that book anymore because you can easily look up the parasites that, we're, that we have to find pictures and diagrams online. So we're going to make use of those computers. Yep. No. No. Well, I'll show you what, what we have posted. There is a word list that, that's up, and that's what we'll, we'll use for our practicals and quizzes. All right? All right.